Hi there, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is that you're watching this. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I am your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for the next almost half hour or so, I'm going to be ranting away at you at things that I think are important, I think worthy of your attention, and maybe even doing something about. Uh, as always, comments, questions, or reactions can be sent to me directly. My personal email, whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Uh, and if you didn't catch that, go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can get the email address from there, or you can uh, leave a message there, leave a comment there if you'd like. Uh, as always, if you do send me email, please include something in the subject line to make it clear this is not spam. And um, be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm really lousy at answering email, but I do get around to it. You will get an answer. All right. With that much out of the way, let's start out as we always like to do uh, whenever we can with good news. And uh, here the good news keeps on coming. On November 5th, Judge Rex Burleson of the St. Louis Circuit Court of Missouri, the State Court of Missouri, declared Missouri's ban on same-sex marriage is unconstitutional. The court finds and declares, Burleson wrote, quoting him again, that any same-sex couple that satisfies all the requirements for marriage under Missouri law other than being of different sexes is legally entitled to a marriage license. The city of St. Louis and the county of St. Louis immediately began issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples. Advocates for the cause say that this ruling actually applies statewide. Now, uh, Missouri State Attorney General Chris Coster uh, appealed the ruling to the state Supreme Court, but he didn't ask for a stay, which is perhaps less surprising than it might seem because Coster had already earlier signaled that his office was backing off of uh, defending the state's ban in court. Uh, for example, last month, a judge in Kansas City ruled that the state of Missouri has to recognize same-sex marriages that were legally created in other states. Uh, Coster, in that case, declined to appeal the case. So his appeal here may actually be sort of pro forma. Uh, and that may be especially true because two days later, uh, on November 7th, a federal district judge, one Ortree Smith, also found that Missouri's ban on same-sex marriage is unconstitutional, uh, that it violates the U.S. Constitution guarantees of equal protection and due process. This was the first federal decision on same-sex marriage in the Eighth Circuit, now, four states in that circuit, uh, besides Missouri, uh, Arkansas, Nebraska, and both Dakotas, have bans on same-sex marriage, while two others, uh, Iowa and Minnesota, it is legal. Okay, and to round things out, on November 7th, that same day, the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals refused to hear an appeal from Kansas of a lower court, a district court ruling, uh, saying that the state could not enforce its ban on same-sex marriage. Now, that decision was expected because the Tenth Circuit was one of those circuits that had already ruled in the cases of other states with essentially identical laws that they fall before the U.S. Constitution. But it still means that um, the decision was welcomed because it means for Kansas this is the end of the road and same-sex marriage has come to Kansas. And that, of course, immediately brings up the not good news. On November 6th, apparently the first week of November was a very busy week on this front. On November 6th, the Sixth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals upheld, approved, sanctioned legal discrimination against same-sex couples by the states of Kentucky, Michigan, Ohio, and Tennessee. Uh, Same-sex couples who want to get married or have their marriages conformed in other places recognized there are, at least for now, out of luck. The ruling was by a three-judge panel was a split one, two to one. Now, the thing is, neither the ruling nor the split came as a particular surprise. People had been kind of predicting that, kind of expecting that ever since the oral arguments. But the thing is, what struck me here was not the decision itself, but the utter vacuity of the logic being used. 
Essentially, every argument the majority offered to approve of bans on same-sex marriage could have been, and in fact most of them were, used years ago to support bans on interracial marriage. During oral arguments, uh, Judge Jeffrey Sutton said, quoting him, I would have thought the best way to get respect and dignity is through the democratic process. Well, Sutton, writing the majority opinion, uh, basically seconded his own words, writing that it is up to legislators, not judges, to decide whether to preserve the traditional definition of marriage. That is, states get to define marriage, and apparently human rights are subject to majority approval. It frankly would appear that Sutton thinks that Loving v. Virginia, this was the landmark Supreme Court decision in 1967 that struck down the remaining bans on interracial marriage, apparently Sutton thinks that was wrongly decided. Now what's more, uh, the decision here, uh, in this case, claimed to find a rational basis for the state bans, uh, that basis being establishing ground rules, quote, to create and maintain stable relationships within which children may flourish. What, so now same-sex couples are unfit parents? Is that what's being argued here? Oh, and by the way, uh, that kind of argument was also raised against interracial marriage. The argument was, think of the children. Think of the problems and difficulties interracial children are going to face in their lives. Now, it's true, the court said, that marriage has also come to be viewed uh, not just for raising children, but as a way to solemnize relationships characterized by mutual commitment. Gay couples, I'm quoting the court here, gay couples, no less than straight ones, are capable of such relationships. Well, grant of them to acknowledge that. Although it would have been a lot better if they had not immediately followed it up with, in essence, a statement that was like, uh, yeah, but big deal. The majority even threw in the slippery slope argument here. If it's unconstitutional to restrict marriage to the traditional one man, one woman um, uh, a definition, um, it must be, quoting the court, it must be constitutionally irrational to stand by the monogamous definition of marriage. And again, the slippery slope argument was one that used against, uh, used to support bans on interracial marriage saying that, well, if we, if we can ban interracial marriage and say, and say that's, uh, we can't ban interracial marriage because that's unconstitutional, well then, what's to prevent this and this and this and this? I'm surprised the majority in this case didn't ring in the classic thing about people marrying farm animals. In fact, the, the opinion offered here was so vacuous and so devoid of cohesive arguments or any new arguments that the dissenting judge in the case, her name is Martha Craig Doherty, suggested that getting the case to the Supreme Court was actually the goal of Sutton and the judge that agreed with him. Doherty wrote, quoting her, because the correct result is so obvious, one is tempted to speculate that the majority has purposefully taken the contrary position to create the, uh, the circuit split. Because the thing is, this creates a split among the circuit courts, with the 4th, 7th, 9th, and 10th circuits uh, having a knocked down uh, uh, bans on same-sex marriage, and now the 6th upholding them. That split sharply increases the chances that the Supreme Court will step in to make a final ruling. The real question is when. Uh, an appeal of, of this decision would have to be ready by the middle of, uh, the middle of January for there to be a chance for the court to accept the case and rule on it by June, June of, uh, the coming June, June of 2015, when the current Supreme Court session ends. If that appeal is not ready by that time, uh, the case will be pushed off till the next Supreme Court session and uh, probably would not be, have a decision before June of 2016. All right, but we're going to move on from there for now uh, to one of our regular weekly features. It's the Clown Award, given as always for meritorious stupidity. 
And the winner of the Big Red Nose this week is one of the most important, significant people of whom you have probably never heard who is not a right-wing billionaire. His name is Tom Wheeler. Now, our story here actually starts some time back, but the current chapter began on November 10th. That's when Barack Obama, the amazing Mr. O, put an end to months and months of vacillating and tiptoeing, or in other words, put an end to months and months of being Barack Obama, uh, and came out in favor of, quoting, the strongest possible rules to protect net neutrality. The principle that internet service providers, or ISPs as they're called, can't favor some uh, internet traffic over others. That is, that all web traffic must be treated equally. Uh, this net neutrality has been a bedrock principle of, uh, uh, of the internet all along and has been a major driving force behind its expansion and its development because everyone had equal access, so everybody had an equal chance to get their message out. Whether that message was a commercial one or a philosophical one or a political one, or as always seems to be true with most human endeavors, whether it was porn. The thing is that principle of net neutrality has been under attack for some time by the major ISPs such as Comcast and Time Warner. They want to be able to cut deals with uh, high traffic websites to promise them faster access, higher speeds of transmission of their data in return for special fees those websites would pay to the, to the ISPs. Now, years ago, when the idea of the Internet was just getting going, just getting started, Al Gore referred to what became the Internet as the information superhighway. You could think of what's, what, the, what the telecoms want here as saying that you've got this highway, but they want to put toll booths on every entry ramp. And if you can afford the tolls, you can be up there on that multi-lane highway. But if you can't, you're stuck on the single lane, rutted back roads, complete with traffic jams and red lights. Now, the big websites, the telecoms obviously like this because it makes them more money. The big websites also like the idea because it tends to cement their dominance in the internet market against the risk of some upstart site challenging their position. Uh, and competing for their traffic, since the, the idea is the, the big sites, the big guns, can easily afford the fees that the telecoms will want, while startups quite possibly couldn't. Now, the FCC has been muddling about trying to find a way to satisfy the corporate giants while at least looking like it's protecting net neutrality. Well, now Obama has come out in favor of the simplest, most straightforward way of dealing with this issue, reclassify the ISPs as common carriers under the Telecommunications Act. That would allow them to be regulated like public utilities, and just as the case with your telephone, could make it illegal, quoting the law, to make any unjust, unreasonable discrimin discrimination in charges, practices, classifications, regulations, facilities, or services. In other words, Everything is equal, just like all your phone calls are equal, all internet traffic would be equal. Enter Tom Wheeler. Tom Wheeler is the chair of the FCC. And just hours after Obama's statement, even as his own office was releasing a statement claiming that Wheeler opposes what are called internet fast lanes, Wheeler was telling a group of business executives from major web comp companies such as Google and Yahoo and Etsy and so on that he wants a more nuanced approach. He wants what he calls a hybrid approach, the approach which would essentially allow precisely the sort of fee-for-speed arrangements that the principle of net neutrality rejects while claiming to protect net neutrality by saying that paid prioritization deals would have to be proved that they are just and reasonable. In other words, they would be considered on a case-by-case -case basis and look at how well that procedure has done to curb corporate mergers. But skip the legal technicalities about, about this. In fact, skip the technical technicalities about net neutrality. Here's a handy quick guide to four things you need to keep in mind in considering this issue. One, if someone loudly insists that they are absolutely opposed to, to site blocking, 
which is the thing where ISPs can simply block access to certain legal websites of their choosing. If anyone says that, they're trying to con you. Everyone from the very beginning, everyone on all sides in this, from the very beginning has been against site blocking. The real fight here is over paid prioritization and its opposite, which is called throttling, which is where an ISP will deliberately slow down traffic to or from a particular site. So anyone who goes around balahooing their opposition to site blocking is actually trying to hide their support of prioritization and throttling. Two, Verizon is starting a new online tech and lifestyle magazine they're calling Sugarstring.com. Remember, Verizon is one of these major ISPs. It's a telecommunications corporation that provides access to the Internet. Applicants for jobs at this online magazine have been told literally in so many words that they will be not be allowed to write anything about net neutrality. Or domestic spying, by the way, which is another area where Verizon has, let's say, a vested interest. Three, third thing to keep in mind, Ted Cruz is against net neutrality. He calls it Obamacare for the Internet. Four, Tom Wheeler is a former lobbyist for the telecommunications industry who recently declared, I am an independent agency. This is a reference to the FCC. The thing is, he didn't say, I'm with an independent agency. He didn't even say, I head an independent agency. He said, I am an independent agency. Apparently, le tasse de moi. Oh, wait, there's a fifth thing you could keep in mind when you consider this. Tom Wheeler is a clown, and we're going to take a break. And we're back. Now, it's been uh, more than a week since the election, and, uh, you know, a lot of people are probably pretty depressed about what came out. So just to sort of try to keep people's spirits up a little bit, I'm going to take, spend some time talking about some good things that I think came out of the election. They're kind of scattered around different individual things, but I still think it's worth looking at. Um, for one thing, uh, Representative Alan Grayson of Florida won re-election by a double-digit margin. The reason that's important is because he basically was target number one by the right wing in the House of Representatives. Uh, also, Representative Keith Ellison, who was the first Muslim to be elected to Congress, won re-election by a margin of something over 40 points. Now, another case. Uh, this is a small but an interesting case. Uh, the city of Richmond, California. Uh, this is home to a refinery, which is run by the Chevron Oil Company. And there was a major fire at that refinery a few years ago, caused a lot of damage, and the city wound up suing Chevron to try to recover some of the costs. Well, rather than taking its chances in court, Chevron decided it would be cheaper to try to take over the city government. So in the elections this fall, uh, there was uh, a hand-picked slate of candidates that Chevron put up, pro-corporate candidates, which they then backed up with $3 million in advertising. Remember, this is a municipal election. Three million dollars in advertising on behalf of their hand-picked candidates. They lost. Progressive candidates won the mayor's office and three of the four open seats on the city council. It is true in politics, as it is most other places, that money talks. Happily, uh, sometimes people are wise enough to not listen. And on the issue of guns, something we've talked about here a lot, Voters in the state of Washington have voted to institute universal background checks on firearm sales, including at gun shows and private sales. At the same time, those voters rejected an initiative that would have banned background checks unless they were mandated by federal law. Both these victories were by considerably over, and they were well into double digits in their majorities. Now, the right wing, of course, immediately tried to dismiss this result uh, because, got to remember, elections to the right wing are meaningful only if they win. Otherwise, they don't really count. 
um, which is why uh, voter suppression to them uh, in their minds is apparently protecting the integrity of the process. Well, in response to this, to, to the vote in Washington, the right-wing site Breitbart.com blew it off by comparing it to wins in various races around the country won by candidates who were endorsed by the NRA, the nutsoid rabbit brains of America. And Breitbart claimed that this win, these wins by NRA-supported candidates means that nationally gun control advocates got a shellacking even though guns actually were not an issue in most of those campaigns. Massachusetts, meanwhile, has become the third state in the country to require employers to offer paid sick time off to employees. Two, other, two major municipalities, Trenton and Montclair, New Jersey, did the same, and Oakland, California, voted to expand that state's requirement on sick time. This is actually, this paid sick time, this is actually something that's been gaining ground. Just two years ago, just one state and three cities had such, had such laws. Now the number is three states and 16 cities. Uh, on another front, Oregon and Alaska became the third and fourth states to legalize marijuana for recreational purposes, following the path set by Colorado and Washington. The District of Columbia repealed all penalties for possession of small amounts and even allowed for some limited private cultivation of marijuana. Meanwhile, a vote in Florida to uh, approve uh, uh, medical marijuana got 57% of the vote. Now, unfortunately, this meant it failed because this was a constitutional amendment that was proposed that requires a 60% vote. But still, it got 57% despite a massive onslaught of misleading ads full of deception and fear-mongering. Okay, the thing is though, most of those results have come from places generally thought of as, you know, more or less liberal. You know, California, Washington, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Oregon. But now, the references I just made to Alaska and to some extent Florida get us to the real meat of this, the real meat of this, the meat of both the elation and the frustration, the hope and despair. The people of the United States, even in deep red states, continue to vote for liberal or progressive policies even as they vote for reactionary right-wing candidates. Here's an example. The city of Denton, Texas, you can see where it is on the map there, Denton, Texas is known as the place where fracking, hydraulic fracturing or fracking, was actually invented. Denton, Texas has now voted to ban the process within city limits. Now, if you're not familiar with this, fracking is a means of increasing production from oil and natural gas wells by pumping a mixture of water, sludge, and one of several different uh, cocktails of toxic chemicals, and we actually don't know exactly what's in these various mixtures because they're regarded as trade secrets, which the companies do not have to reveal. But they, they pump this mixture into a well under such pressure that it literally fractures the surrounding rock, allowing more oil or natural gas or whatever to seep out of these fissures. This practice has been connected to contaminated water and earthquakes. And by a margin of 18 points, the voters of Denton, Texas, made it the first city in the state to ban fracking. Now, similar bans also passed in Mendocino County and San Bernito County in California and in the city of Athens, Ohio. Uh, unhappily, attempts at uh, similar bans uh, lost in another California county and in three Ohio cities. But as uh, Bruce Bazell of the group Earthworks said, if Denton, Texas, which is probably more familiar with fracking than anywhere else in the country, if Denton, Texas can't live with fracking, who can? The answer is no one. Now something else, uh, a so-called personhood amendment, you may have heard about these, uh, these uh, personhood amendment is one that declares that a fetus, even a zygote, is a person with full legal rights from the very moment of conception. Now, such measures would not only ban all abortions, they would actually outlaw some methods of birth control. Well, in North Dakota, 
a state so against abortion that only one abortion provider survives in the entire state. In North Dakota, 64% of voters just rejected a personhood initiative, repeating the success that occurred in the state of Mississippi just three years earlier. Now, there was also a personhood amendment on the ballot in Colorado. That one also failed, but that one was expected. But North Dakota? Another issue, conservative groups made a big push to oust certain state Supreme Court justices in Tennessee, North Carolina, Kansas, and Montana on the grounds that they are too liberal, which to them means that they are liberal at all, uh, which in their ads became dangerously radical. Altogether, there were nine judges targeted across those four states, three of them safely red, one of them kind of ambiguously purple. Despite that, every one of those nine judges retained their seats. But the big one, the one that had everybody talking, was the minimum wage. Initiatives to raise the minimum wage, the state minimum wage, appeared on the ballot in four of the deepest red states, Alaska, Arkansas, Nebraska, and South Dakota. Every one of them passed by margins ranging from 10 to 38 points. Passed in the states that on the very day sent to Congress a slew of right-wing fanatics who would do away with the minimum wage if they possibly could. The funny thing is, this is nothing new. This is, this is nothing new. This is a pattern that goes back decades at least. I mean, it goes back at least minimum 30 years. And I can say that because in 1984, I remember very clearly the presidential election between Walter Mondale and Ronald Reagan. During that campaign, uh, voters were asked in various polls, how do you feel about this issue and how do you feel about that issue and the other issue? And over and over and over again, the answers people gave as to how they felt about those issues lined them up with Mondale rather than Reagan. But in those same polls, when you ask people who are you voting for over and over and over again, they said Reagan. People were not only voting against their own interests, they were voting against their own desires. And we still are. Or maybe it should be said more accurately that you know, they're actually not voting at all. Turnout for the 2014 midterms was estimated at 36%. Apparently, a lot of us think that our right to vote is so precious that we shouldn't even dare touch it at all. All right, last for this week is uh, another one of our occasional features. This one is called the Hero Award. This is where somebody is uh, recognized for just, just doing the right thing on a matter big or small. Every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. for the last 23 years, 90-year-old Arnold Abbott has been feeding the homeless at a public beach at Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He organized and headed up the Marine A. Abbott Love Thy Neighbor Fund, which was named in favor, uh, uh, rather in honor, of his late wife, with whom he first began to feed homeless and first began to feed the hungry, uh, hungry back in 1979. But... Since January 2013, 21 states across the country have passed laws restricting public feedings of the homeless and the hungry, and 10 more have similar rules under consideration, according to an October report from the National Coalition for the Homeless. Nationwide, at least 57 cities have limited or banned public feeding of the hungry and homeless. In late October, Fort Lauderdale became one of those cities, passing a law for the specific purpose of making it harder to feed hungry homeless people. The new law requires not only permits for setting up uh, a station on public property, it requires portable toilets, hand washing facilities, and more. Facilities which the kind of shoestring operations that do this kind of charitable work generally simply cannot afford. Violations are punishable by up to 60 days in prison, a $500 fine, or both. On November 2nd, two days after this law went into effect, Abbott and several volunteers went out and ran a food station outside a public park in open defiance of the law. He and two members of the local clergy were charged with violating the law and taken away. The city insists they were not arrested, merely cited uh, for a later court appearance, but since they were taken away by police and held before being released, that just strikes me as a difference that's more semantic than real. 
Three days later at 5.30 p.m., Abbott was there at the beach where he had been every Wednesday for 23 years. He was again cited, now faces a second $500 fine or 60-day sentence. He says he won't give up. It's unlikely that the city government of Fort Lauderdale will be shamed into changing its ways because this is not the first measure the city has taken to respond to homelessness by trying to make it invisible rather than dealing with it. Be that as it may, however, one thing does remain clear. Arnold Abbott is a hero. And that's it for this week. We're going to get out of here. You have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week. Peace.